Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this nice hot Tuesday evening. My name is Gail Zumble. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Nine Mile Creek is um, about 50 square miles, the watershed all as a whole in the Southwest Metro. So our watershed is about 50 square miles, taking up parts of Bloomington, Richfield, Hopkins, Edina, Minnetonka, and Eden Prairie. So we have parts of those different cities and our goal is to try and keep lakes and creeks healthy. So we do a lot of different things at the Watershed District. We have projects and a little bit of regulatory authority as well. And then we also do education programs like this for adults and families and even um, professional trainings like um, salt trainings in the wintertime. So if you want to hear more about any of those events that we've got coming up, you can certainly sign up for our newsletter at ninemilecreek.org, and that's an electronic newsletter that comes out hmm, probably every couple months and tells you about upcoming events, cost share grants, things like that. It'll also tell you about our upcoming photo contest. That is an every other year occurrence that um, people can take pictures all around the watershed district and submit them by September of this year and then winners will have their photos put into the photo calendar for 2021. This is a highly uh, requested photo calendar. People really look forward to it coming out every year. So hopefully this webinar tonight will give you some good tips and you can go out and take some pictures and submit them to our contest. Just a couple things about this team's webinar here. Um, the presentation will go until about 745 and then there's also a Q&A. So it looks like two little chat bubbles on uh, your screen if you are logging in on a desktop or mobile device. Um, some people have um, called in with the webinar number so that's um, hopefully that is also working and I'm going to be working here behind the scenes while Dick is presenting to hopefully troubleshoot if anything is going wrong for you folks. But you can certainly um, put a question into the Q&A. Again, it's a little chat bubbles with a question mark and it will send it to me and I can either answer you um, just privately or I may also publish questions if it seems like that's something that will help the rest of the folks. And then um, we will also have a Q&A for Dick at the very end. So if you have questions, feel free to send those in and I'll ask those to our presenter. You can also turn on captions if you'd like. Um, if you go to the little icon that looks like a gear wheel, you should be able to turn on captions if you would like to have that option. I also wanted to let you know that this will be recorded and um, sent out later. Um, to the email that you registered with. So again, let me know if you have any questions and thanks again for joining us. And I'm going to introduce our uh, speaker, Dick Bergstrom, who is a past photo contest winner and um, photographer extraordinaire. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dick here. Thanks, Gail. Greetings, campers. I, I you know, it's always fun to be um, part of one of these things. You'll have to um, excuse me if I stumble a little bit. I'm used to being right in front of you. Uh, this this webinar, this distance learning is new to me, but we're going to have some fun. I, I hope you guys will come along for a walk. We'll run you through all four uh, all four seasons and hopefully uh, you'll learn something. And when I do these presentations, I'm here to learn as well. I am a amateur wildlife photographer in my spare time. And that means that I'm never too old to learn. So if you guys catch me um, stating something that's incorrect or you have information that you want to add to the to the presentation, send it on into Gail through the Q&A and she'll make sure that that information gets back to me so that the next time I do this type of presentation, I'll, I'll make sure that I add correct information. All right, let's see what we have here. Oh. Look at that, the first, there it is. The first button that didn't work. First of all, I just want to reiterate what Gail had mentioned. I want to take a moment to recognize the staff over at Nine Mile Creek. Uh, Randy's the district administrator. Erica uh, runs program and, and projects. 
Lauren Foley is a permit and water resources. Gail, of course, is education and outreach. And we can't forget Megan. I, I Megan, I apologize. It appears I added a consonant to your name, but um, I'm sure you'll make it through. And make sure that you take some time to to look through the, the web page to look at all the different things that Nine Mile Creek Watershed District does. And of course, as Gail mentioned, there is a, a calendar contest coming up. I think there you're limited to 15 photographs, if I'm not mistaken. You want to make sure that they're they're not edited. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm working my way through some um, through some allergies. You want to make sure that they're not edited, that you send in your best shot, and you never know things might happen. You might get your stuff published and put into a calendar. Uh, as as Gail mentioned, my name's Dick Bergstrom. Uh, I live in South Bloomington with my wife and uh, two sons and our kitty cat. We've been here for 21 years, so that makes us uh, the new kids on the block. We are close to Harrison Park, which is a few steps away from Nine Mile Creek, which is a few more steps away from Moyer Park. And if you walk a little farther, not too many steps, about a mile and a half, you get down to the Minnesota River. And that's where I spend a good part of my time. All of the pictures that you're gonna see tonight have been taken in the state of Minnesota. The majority of these pictures right here in Bloomington. So wherever you are and whenever you are, whatever time of day you end up watching this, welcome. All right, so we've got uh, this particular slide. The first few slides we're gonna go over, and again, I apologize for this uh, malfunction, but we'll get through it. The first few slides we'll go over is focus. I had a, um, a uh, photography teacher who used to like to say focus on focus. Keep your eyes focused. This particular one shows you what you're gonna run into on the trail. Well, I'm gonna say 75% of the time you're looking at the uh, wildlife. In this case, it's a woodpecker, but what you can see in the foreground is a branch. The camera wants to look at the thing that's closest to it. Unfortunately, you can't. This was 75 yards away. I can't reach up and snap that branch off and expect that the, the woodpecker to stay still. Plus, it's not my style to go to, to go wrecking the forest just to make sure I can get a shot. What I want you to understand is don't be don't be put off by this. Don't say I, I, I can't do it. It's, it's too hard. There are a couple of ways to trick your lens. To, to not see that branch in front of you. That would be probably another presentation. Let's see if I can find the, the next shot. It's a little harder on here. And I'll show you what it's supposed to look like. All right. There we go. So you can still see the branch in front of, in the foreground, but it's blurred and the woodpecker isn't. Again, I apologize for the diminutive size for this presentation, but we're going to have to go with it this way. The woodpecker is in focus. That's what I was looking for. The branch in front of it, I didn't want there. Don't lose hope. You can do this. It doesn't matter what camera you're using. If you're using a long lens like I have, or if you're using your cell phone, you have to be a little closer with the cell phone. If you have a point and shoot, that's fine too. Hopefully you'll you'll be able to find a few shots that'll make you happy. <laughs> All right, crowdsource you, 101. All right, so just for just because the crowd is is watching, you're interested. Um, there happens to be a prize that goes along with this particular shot. Shot. First of all, this is um, this is intended to show focus. The the animal is in the foreground. The backup background is blurred. There's a there's a term for the blurred or creamy blurred background. I'm pronouncing it bokeh. Um, it could be bokeh. It's not boquet like or a bouquet of roses. But what I'm looking for and what you'll look for is you want your subject to be focused on, and and it's okay if the background is out of focus. Now, the reason there's a prize for this. The first one that sends in 
the correct identification of this bird to Gail through your Q&A will win. I don't know if you can see me. Can, can they see me? All right. This is a single chamber bat house. All right. One chamber. It's made out of cedar. It'll last forever. They're awesome. They're a lot of fun. And yes, I made it a, a number of years ago. However, the first one to send in the correct answer that it correctly identifies this particular animal, this bird, will win that bat house. And I'll make sure that Gail um, gets me an address if I have to mail it, if I have to bring it over to you, and depending on how far you are, we'll get it to you. All right, now we're cooking with Crisco. Here's another shot. Remember the last shot, that particular animal, this is a, a member of its family, was in the foreground. This particular one, the focus on the camera is on the branch and not the bird. However, I'm okay with that. It's, it's showing both the bird a little bit of perspective. It shows you what they're looking for. These particular birds enjoy those little crab apples. They also like the um, um, cedar trees, have those little blue berries on them. They nibble on those. Um, and you're likely to see these guys running in flocks or families. I'm, I'm giving you everything but the answer to the, the former question. But this is a good representation of me being OK with the shot being somewhat out of focus. I can see what the what the bird is. I like the context of the branch. I like the color of the these little crab apples. So you can do this. Every single one of you out there can do this, whether you're a professional or you're just starting. Every one of you is capable of producing something like this and even better. Just remember focus on focus. Take some time to learn your equipment. Try not to overthink things. And the reason I'm sharing that now is because a little bit later, the last third of this presentation, we're going to talk about something called a rule of thirds, and that can really bog you down. So have fun with it. All right. I'm going to kind of move a little faster since our presentation was slow at the beginning. This is another, another shot showing something in the foreground that distracted my lens. This is, I think it's a purple salvia that this monarch butterfly is on. However, I'm okay with that. In the world that I live in, these butterflies don't stand still. They don't pose for you. They're not interested in what you're interested in. So you take the shots when you can get the shots. In this case, I would have preferred that piece of the flower be out of the shot but it's okay. It's part of what you see when you're out on the trail. It's part of what you're going to experience. So don't look at this when you get it home and you, and you load it on your computer or wherever you're going to show it or edit this shot. Don't look at it and think of it as a failure. This to me was a wonderful shot. It gets a lot of commentation, uh, a commentary when I, when I show it, and I really do enjoy it. So don't don't be too critical. Don't be too hard on yourself. Here's another one. This is focus. This is a good example of focus on the foreground. These are geese, Canadian geese. This is down where Nine Mile Creek. There's a little trail that heads from the creek over to the Minnesota River. This was in the spring and it was spring flooding. I don't know if you can tell from where you're looking, but each one of these geese is just resting and they're resting on one foot. The, the goose in the foreground is on one foot and it has one eye open and it's watching me, which is kind of fun because I played around with these geese quite a while that day. But as you progress farther and farther in the back, uh, the background, you see that they, go, they become more and more out of focus. That's what I was hoping for. That's what I was shooting for. I think it lends to this particular shot it tells a story. Um, every shot, every picture tells a story, as the song says, and every picture is worth a thousand words. So again, don't be afraid to try. Learn your camera. If you have a cell phone, I'm going to pick mine up. I have an iPhone. Um, I like their cameras. I've never used an Android. Um, they have a lot of editing built in. 
I don't use too much editing. When I do edit on, on my desktop, I use a, a, a Apple product. It's a free product called Picasa, not Picasso, Picasa. It has more than enough energy and horsepower for me. I, I, I never edit anything out of the picture that's in there. In other words, I don't have Photoshop. I'm not, I'm not gonna cut Photoshop down. It's a wonderful program. Um, Picasa's free. I like the cost of Picasa. I choose not to take things out of the photographs. I shoot them as they are. All right. Now we move on to lighting. Some of you can, can quickly identify what I'm shooting here. This is poor lighting. It was a, it was kind of a gray day. It was winter. The sun was, it was already starting to set and it was somewhat off to my left. So it didn't light the subject at all. I'm going to say another 50% easy of the, of the shots that I take are shot poorly in poor light. The lighting is either behind the subject. In, in this case, you'll get a silhouette. This particular, um, it happens to be a raptor. Uh, you can tell by the ears or what look like ears, what kind of animal this is. I happen to like this. I carry it with on presentations just to show that every shot I take isn't a clear shot. It isn't perfectly lit. It's not always in focus. This is the trouble that I run into out on, out on the trail, just the same as every one of you will. This happens to be a great horned owl. Um, I've had the, the pleasure and the good fortune to, to follow a mating pair of great horned owls for the last five or six years, perhaps seven, as well as a mating pair of barred owls. Um, I get asked quite frequently if I'll take photographers to where these owls live. And you'll have to understand that I'm rather hesitant to take them into the owl's territory. I, I have to know you. I have to know that you're not going to pin this on a, on a, a GPS map. Uh, I, I don't necessarily want tours coming through. These owls like their privacy. They, 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 they really need to have that privacy respected. They know me. They know that I'm not going to come close. They know that I'm not going to do anything dangerous. Um, they've, they know me to the extent that they've gotten used to me, or at least that's the way I feel. They don't fly away now. Um, whether or not they recognize me is, is, you know, that's perhaps that's a silly pipe dream, but no, I don't, I don't give away the, uh, the exact location of these, of these owls. And, and, um, if you want to come, uh, on a photography hike with me sometime, I've given them before more than happy to do so. Probably three to five people, that's that's probably a good number. We don't want too many out there. All right. Now, this is a barred owl. This is in the middle of winter. This particular day was about 20 below zero. And you can't see it on this shot, or maybe maybe you can. It's, it's right eye is almost closed and if for anyone that's been outside in the in the dead of winter when it's well below zero, you know that your breath you, your breath freezes. It freezes to your face. It freezes to your eyelids. It freezes to your eyebrows. I have a mustache. I used to have a goatee. It would freeze to anything on my face. This particular owl has some frost on its on its uh, the feathers that make up its eyelid on its right eye. You can't see that. I can see it. I know it's there. Um, it was looking for any kind of sun, any kind of warmth. Again, the, the light angle is really, really low on this one. Again, it was 20 below when I went out. Um, this is illustrative of halfway decent lighting. The, the light is in the subject's face, which is what I wanted to photograph. It was turned away from me earlier. I, I made a little clicking sound and it turned towards the sound. Um, again, I know these owls, they know me. Um, when it turned towards me, it leaned into the, into the light. It was in the shade. The branch that it's sitting on took a little bit of the focus away from my camera. Don't worry about it. 
the, you know, this would this is a wonderful shot. I, I had a great series that day. I, I'm just really, really happy to be out when it's cold. I don't do really well when it's hot and sticky like today. But this one I think is, is a good illustration of something that's centered, it's focused, the lighting is, is pretty good. This is the owl's mate. I believe this is the, the owl's mate. This was uh, late spring. You can see the leaves are, are, are budding there. And it flew right up to me. I, I, I didn't know where it was gonna land. It was low. It had breakfast. That's a vole. Um, it could be a mole. It's not a mouse. This is what the owls eat. This again is a barred owl. I put this one in here for lighting. Uh, because you see half the face is in, it's in sunlight. The other half is in shadow and I didn't edit the other half out. I could have brought the light up. I could have changed the way this particular photograph looks in editing and post-processing. Um, the type of processing that I do in editing is I want to bring it back to as near as natural as I found it. So my brain has to remember what I was seeing. I don't edit in the field. I don't look at any shots on my viewfinder in the field. The viewfinder is turned off and turned back towards the camera. I, I get to see what I shot when I come back home. This particular day was uh, a lot of fun. This guy hung around. He gobbled down his breakfast, and I assumed that there was some owlets somewhere in a nest. I never did find the nest that year. This was three years ago. But it, um, I like to tell the story that it thought enough of me that it was going to sh share what it was having for breakfast. And it stayed there and, and let me photograph it for um, as long as I wanted. Uh, you have to, once again, you have to remember this is, I'm shooting with a telephoto lens. I have a 500 millimeter lens on my camera. If you don't know what a 500 millimeter looks like, just think of a, a telescope on your camera. That's pretty much what it looks like. This was taken from roughly 100 yards. And that's far enough. So this particular owl will keep an eye on me but it felt comfortable eating that. And then it was gonna bring it back to, uh, to the owlets in the nest. And I, I didn't bother to um, watch it or wait for it to fly into the nest. I like the composition of this one. We'll get into the rule of thirds a little bit later. I like the composition. It's centered. There's a lot going on in this particular picture, but I enjoy the, the sort of the yin, the yin and the yang, the light and the dark of the face. The fact that you can see it's breakfast I assume that was breakfast, probably brunch. And um, if I was to zoom in a little bit more, you'd be able to see detail on the on the talons, the feet. You could see the eyes. You could see the beak. Um, there's a lot going on here. So be happy when you find these shots. They are out there for you. You you will be able to get them. Just continue to try. All right. This is a green heron and it's eating a zacadia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I put this in for lighting because the orange, what looks like orange on the ground just behind it, that's sunlight. And it actually stepped into shade and it stepped into focus. It was out of focus and it walked towards me, stepped into shade. Now this was during, I think it was last summer when the, um, Normandale Lake was, uh, they drew Normandale Lake down for the curly leaf I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, they had to treat for some of the invasive species. Uh, I want to make mention that they did not kill everything. They were only after curly leaf. The rest of the natural habitat, the rest of the the um, the plant life that that all the fish and the um, invertebrates rely on should have stayed healthy. And I've been around uh, Normandale Lake a lot this year, and it certainly looks healthy to me. So anyways, this green heron was just munching away. Again, practice, practice, practice. Have fun. Don't overthink things. When you see the shot, take the shot. All right? All right, here's another one that's, that's lighting. Again, when we go back to the first shot where the branch was in the way. This, this happens to be a young great horned owl. The great horned owl that you saw earlier in silhouette, that is one of, that is this owlet's parent. 
one of the two. I, I, I don't know if it's a male or a female, the parent, and I don't know the sex of this one. Uh, I followed these guys through uh, uh, fledging and was fortunate to be able to watch them fly away. This one had gotten out of the nest and was just literally just stretching its wings. But you can see the frustration if you're a photographer and you don't want that big branch in the way. You can't tell the owl, to, hey, can you move somewhere else? This guy was enjoying a wonderful day. The reason I put this in here for lighting is because the background is just about as light as it, as it was. It was a really gray, kind of an overcast, cloudy day, really hard to shoot, hard to find where the light was. Again, I, I, I made a clicking sound. It drew this owl's attention to me. It was looking out over a pond. It looked at me, was flapping its wings. One of the reasons it was flapping its wings is because a crow had found it and it was starting to pester it. And this little guy doesn't know what to do with crows. It, uh, it barely knew what its wings were for. So I took a quick series of shots and I moved away. Again, we wanna respect the wildlife, make sure that we're never too close. Um, one thing that I like to do when I focus through a telephoto lens is to focus with both eyes open. For those that, that know telephoto lenses, you'll understand what that means. It helps me keep perspective. All right, now we're gonna move into that pesky thing called a rule of thirds. For those of you that understand what up north means, this is the uh, harbor up in Grand Marais. This is one of the, the uh, lighthouses in Grand Marais, um, not Split Rock. This is up in Grand Marais in GM. Um, this is out on something called Artist Point. If you ever have a chance to go up there, I would strongly encourage it. I ventured out there. This was late February, still a lot of ice on the, on the lake. The rule of thirds talks about dividing your, your shot into four equal quadrants. I'm sorry, nine equal quadrants. So if you have three horizontal lines and three vertical lines, um, I'm not gonna dwell too much on the rule of thirds, except to say that when I learned it, the first thing I did was try to break it. So I, I mean that, you heard me right. The first thing I did when I learned the rule of thirds was figure out how to break it. And this particular shot was one of those attempts on trying to figure out how to break it. What I really wanted was that lighthouse, but there's so much more going on in this picture. There are three or four homes that are in the background along the, the, along the shore. This particular shot, you can't see it. I was playing with editing and, and the reason it looks the way it looks is because there's a, there's a button on the Picasso that says, do you wanna make it look like you painted it? And so I tried that. This is supposed to make my shot look like I painted it. Um, I don't usually play around with editing like that. And so this is really the only one that I carry with me. But there's a lot of horizontal, there's vertical, there's diagonal lines, there's sky, there's, there's uh, land, there's any number of things going on. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in the rule of thirds, look it up. I looked it up on Wikipedia. And essentially what it's doing is it tells you how to compose a shot. Now, if I spent as much time as Wikipedia or the dictionary says on composing the shot, I'm gonna lose the shot. When you go back and you take your shots and you then you overlay the rule of thirds, you'll see that you're doing it very intuitively. Um, you'll see that your composition can, can stand up to the rule of thirds. Here's another one, this is, um, this is a green heron back at Normandale Lake. This one is, no, I, I tossed it in there because it's a, it's a pretty decent representation of lighting, focus, and the rule of thirds. Uh, a lot going on here. This particular her, uh, heron was not in, at all concerned that I was there. I shot it with a telephoto lens right off the walking path and I was 10 yards away. I would not recommend getting any closer to these wild animals. Uh, this one was focused on eating. I think later on in the in the um, in the series of slides I had, it it caught a leopard frog. I think it was a frog that it was eating. Um, can be a little uh, unsettling, unnerving to uh, to show shots of that. So I didn't include that. But I hope that this one um, 
shares a, a decent example of the rule of thirds. Here's a fun one. This is catfish. Uh, these are in Nine Mile Creek, just past the old mill. Um, that's down by a little bit uh, north of 106th Street, where Nine Mile takes a sharp right turn and goes downhill. So it would go west and underneath a bridge. Um, just off to the side of the old of the old mill, there are some deep calm waters and these catfish were just loving it. This was a summer day about five years ago and there were 15 or 20 catfish and I focused on a couple. I really enjoy the colors, the lighting I like, the focus, the rule of thirds. I think this pretty much wraps up the lighting focus and rule of thirds. We move into this one. This is a um, a young bald eagle that's being chased by a crow. And I put this in for rule of thirds because if you look at how you're framing the shot, what it, what does the shot tell you? What's the what am I looking at? Am I looking at the crow or the eagle or the sky? It's not for me to decide. You can decide. But I think it sums up rule of thirds. I'm going to move through the next slides relatively quickly. Not sure what you're viewing this on. This is a northern water snake. I put it in for lighting, focus, and rule of thirds as it it occupies the middle third of the screen. You can see the head center left just underneath the stick. This particular snake was just about four feet long. And uh, I was, again, telephoto lens, I was 25 yards away. This was moving water midsummer. The water is about inch and a half deep. I like shooting things in water. I like the distortion the water brings. You can do this with your cell phone. You can do it with a point and shoot, or you can do it with a professional rig. It's up to you, but I would encourage you to get out and try. Going to move on here. This one I like. It's lighting focus color. This is a not quite mature bald eagle. They look kind of uh, kind of calico, kind of different colored like this. They don't get their white head and white tail until the fifth year of life. So they've made all their mistakes. They're there. They make all the silly mistakes. They 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 um, and they are funny to watch when they're young. They trip and fall and stumble just like any other kid. So they when they have their white head and white tail, they've earned it. All right, sorry about that I'm going fast, but we did start late and I want to respect your time. This is a great blue heron fishing in Nine Mile Creek. What it has in its mouth is a bullhead. Um, I've, I watched this guy for two days. I have another slide deck that uh, shows it eating a northern. And uh, the northern was about a foot and a half long. This particular bullhead was, I was amazed that this animal could swallow it. They flip it around, they eat it whole, they eat it head first because they know the dorsal fin will will um, pierce their, their throat and stop them. Um, it took a long time for this particular animal to, to swallow it, but it did just that. I have it here for lighting focus and rule of thirds. A lot going on in this shot, a lot of water spread all over the place, the eyes open, um, I think there is a membrane that covers the eye when they go underwater. This one went underwater to, to catch this fish. Lots of times they spear the fish. This particular time it caught it in its, in its uh, uh, beak. The northern it speared and it had to use its foot to pull it off of its beak. That was an interesting shot. Anyways, we're going to move on. I apologize for the time consuming. If I remember, this is the last slide in the deck. This is a snapping turtle just out doing what snapping turtles do. This is a female. She came up out of the creek. She was looking for high ground to lay her eggs. We're just sort of in the tail end of that particular season now. You're going to see painted turtles. You're going to see snapping turtles. If you're lucky, you'll see a blandings turtle. Um, some others, uh, look up the number, the types of turtles that, that live in Minnesota. Painted turtles and snapping turtles are, are the most prolific. Please leave them alone. Don't pick them up. If you have to, if they're crossing the street, please move them in the direction they were going. If you turn them around, if they just started crossing the street and you turn them around, 
They will literally wait for you to leave and go ahead and cross the street. Their instincts are telling them, I want to go in that direction. So if you must pick them up, you can pick them up by the middle of the shell. Do not pick them up by the tail. I've, I've heard that before. Oh, you got to grab the tail. That is not right. Uh, be careful of their claws. They're, they are sharp. Don't go anywhere near their mouths. Even a painted turtle can, can pinch you really hard. And as quickly and as carefully as you can, move them in the direction they're going. And that will save them. That will help them. Uh, they'll lay their eggs and then they'll do what they do. They may want to come back across the street. Um, you did the best you could. You don't have to stay and wait. If they see you, if they know you're there, they'll just wait for you to leave. So I think this is the last slide, uh, slide that I have in the deck. So then we're going to move on to Q&A. And I'm going to turn this back over to Gail. She's going to send in the questions. I'll do the best I can. Again, thanks for helping out. And uh, I, I hope you guys learned something. And I'm looking forward to your questions and looking forward to learning from you. Thanks so much, Dick. That was great. Those are awesome pictures. And again, you know, kind of to echo what Dick was saying that we would love to see your shots as well. And so practice is a good way to do it. So please feel free to send those into the photo contest or even just send us an email and we can share it out. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A and I will read them out um, to Dick as they come in. Do, do we have anyone that's been brave enough to identify the bird on the, I think it's the fourth slide? Yes, we did. We had several correct identifications, so good job to all uh -huh. of you bird folks out there. Um, Rick right. was the winner of the contest, got in really fast right there at the first, so congratulations Fantastic. to you. We'll Congratulations, work on Rick. Mm -hmm. I, I hope Rick is local. Yes, yes okay. he is. All, All right. right, so we have our first question here, Dick. Uh, the question is, how would you photograph a hummingbird or any fast moving animal for that matter? Great question, thanks for asking. And in the original slide deck, I was considering putting up a, a, a shot of a hummingbird. So um, hummingbirds are, are absolutely fantastic birds to watch. Um, you can photograph. They're not as shy as you think. They're interested in the nectar. If you have a hummingbird feeder, they, they're not going to run away from you. You could photograph a hummingbird with your cell phone. You have to set up the, the hummingbird feeder. You have to know when they come. You have to know where they go. Hummingbirds like a place to run away and hide. So a pine tree, that's a perfect spot. If you have a hummingbird feeder, let's say it's in your backyard, your front yard, and you don't have anywhere for the hummingbird to, to run away to or to fly off to, they may not stick around. With, uh, with my telephoto lens, it's a lot easier because I don't have to be anywhere really close. I use autofocus, not manual, and then set it to the feeder. Um, I typically try not to photograph uh, birds that are um, that are sitting on anything that is man-made. I like to pho photograph them naturally. But if you find a, um, a, a wildflower garden, there are a lot of nectar plants that the hummingbirds hang out to. The Japanese garden over at Normandale College, great place, great place. And then just find out where they are and then set up shop and wait for them to come and be ready and shoot. Great, thank you. Our next question is about time of day. What is the best time of day to take pictures or is there a time that you like most for photography? All right, great question. Uh, time of day, so I have a weather app on my phone and I use it religiously. It tells me when the sun's coming up, it tells me when the sun's going down, and it tells me where the angle of the sun will be so that if I want to choose to go out, if I have time, let's say it's January and I want to go out from 11 to 1, I know where the angle of the sun is. So for me, I want to look where the sun is. I want to make sure the sun's over my back shoulder. I'm not shooting into the sun and then I'll go out. But really an, a quick and easy answer 
whenever you have time, that's the best time to go out. If you're looking for great pictures, every shot you take is a great shot, right? So don't don't worry about having the perfect time of day to go out. Just grab your camera, your cell phone, whatever you're using to shoot. Go out, enjoy, try, focus on focus, have some fun. Hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. Our next question is, do you use a balance stick or monopod or tripod when shooting with a zoom lens? Quick answer is yes to all three, and uh, I don't like any of them. <laughs> um, I have all three of them. Um, I've tried them in different settings. Um, it depends on what you're photographing. Typically tripods and monopods or uh, if you want a balance pod, don't lend themselves nicely to wildlife, primarily because wildlife doesn't stand still. Um, if and so I uh, again, I, I mentioned in my presentation the rule of thirds. I wanted to know what it was just so I could break it. I, I carry an incredibly heavy rig on a shoulder strap and everyone I run into into the field says you're, the rules say you're not supposed to do that. Well, I do it because if I set up on a tripod or a monopod um, without optical stabilization, which my camera has, you're going to get a really blurry shot, a jumpy shot. So you can use them, try them out. If you like them, fantastic. I have um, a quick release on my tripod. It's a little foot that goes on my camera, which has a foot. And then, it, and then it connects to the tripod really quickly, but you might find it a little cumbersome trying to set up, getting the legs just right. So yes, I've used them all. No, I don't carry any of them. Great, thank you. Our next question is, do you recommend artificial lighting like flash if you encounter wildlife during low light situations? Wonderful, wonderful question. Thank you, whoever asked that. Um, OK, so uh, earlier I mentioned we want to be respectful of distance of wildlife. We want to make sure that you understand the minute that you step out of your your domicile, wherever you live, you are now in someone else's domicile. You are where the wildlife lives. They live outside, you live inside. Just imagine if you had a f um, high powered flash go off in your face. Um, Dip, you really don't want to hit the trail in low light with a flash because you'll get one shot and it'll more than likely be washed out and whatever you're shooting is going to fly away, is going to run away, is going to turn and hide. So I don't recommend flash photography for wildlife simply because it's some, they're, they're not used to that and I can't think of a better way to scare them away. So no disrespect for the question. I appreciate that you asked it. And and I I don't use flash on the trail, no. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for these great questions. Our next one is, do you tend to stay in place or move around a lot when you're out taking pictures? Another fantastic question. Uh, you know, it really all depends. Uh, when I'm visiting the owls, you have to go to them other than the shot that I showed where the, the barred owl came and brought me its breakfast, they typically don't come to you. You have to know where they live. So to the extent that you've done your research, you have to move. I use the walking trail just as a, um, it's a starter. It, it gets me to the woods and then I typically follow animal trails. Um, winter is easier to track. For anyone that's been out, winter is much easier to track than summer. You can see the footprints. You can see where they are relative to when it just, say for instance, it just snowed. If there's fresh foot, footprints, you know that's been here just, just now. If I'm looking for deer, if I'm looking for coyote, if I'm looking for a mouse running from a bush to a bush, um, you know, I, I, that's, that's how I move around. So yes, once I find the subject, I'll linger and I'll shoot. 
I want to make sure that I'm respectful of distance. I'm not stepping on their home. I'm not too close to their tree, but once I find them, yeah, then you want to shoot as many shots as you can. Hope that helps. Thank you. Um, our next question has a bit of a um, tie into one of the previous ones. Um, this person is asking if you shoot, shoot on a tripod or if you handhold the camera with a 500 millimeter tele lens. Um, seems like it would be more useful to have a tripod or monopod of some kind. Yeah, great question. Um, again, um, um, I, I do handhold. It's uh, I shoot with a Sigma 15500. Um, some some have called it a Bigma, and I and I'm assuming that that's in reference to the weight. It's um, uh, it's it's three and a half pounds, um, and I have a D7000 Nikon that's on the end of it. So I'm I'm carrying close to four and a half pounds on a neck strap. You're right, it is heavy, but I'm used to it. I've adopted a style. And again, um, especially in the winter, I, I do not carry tripods. I don't carry any gear that I don't need or that I won't use. So um, if you see a, a, a tall person in the woods with a huge camera on a neck strap in the middle of winter, that's me. Um, I don't, I tend not to carry things that I know I'm not gonna use. In my backpack, I'll have um, a bottle of super hot water, especially when it's cold out so it doesn't freeze. I'll have some trail mix. I might have an apple or two and a granola bar, and that's about it. Good advice. Thank you. We do have time for maybe one or two more questions. So the next one that came in was, what was your closest and scariest call shooting wildlife? Haha. <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> um, well, uh, there are two, to the, two that come to mind. Um, I, I put one picture in the slide deck tonight. The other one I didn't. Um, a number of years ago, I was out um, tracking owls and I looked off to my, to my right and about 60 yards to my right, I saw a coyote. And so I thought, well, I'll just track that coyote. They're, they're just, they're not gonna hurt me. Um, they're just keeping track of me. And I was looking for my owl. And it the coyote seemed to be looking past me or through me. So I looked in the direction it was looking. And about 60 yards to my left was another coyote. So there were two of them. And they were keeping close watch on me. Now, I hadn't seen any coyote tracks. I didn't think I was any anywhere near their den. Um, so I suppose you could let your mind wander and say they were sizing me up. They don't, they're not, they're, they're afraid of people. They're not gonna come anywhere near you. So if you wanted to be scared, you could say that was scary. The, um, the, the great horned owl that was on the, on the uh, tree, the dead tree, that was the young one that was flapping its wings. I had been watching a pair. There were a pair of owlets that year. That year I got too close and one of them uh, got frightened and flew into the water. Uh, it didn't realize that it could fly. It stopped its flight and it landed in water. And as soon as it landed in water, that's the same as ringing a dinner bell to the other raptors that would prey on an owl. And wouldn't you know it, there was an eagle right in the top of a tree. Now I recognized the air of my ways. I stayed on scene for about an hour. I waited for the owl to swim back to shore. I have a great series of slides of owls swimming. They're good swimmers. Um, I made sure that owl got back to safety. Uh, didn't sleep at all that night. Went back to the to the tree that they were living in, and saw that yes, indeed, it did make it back up with its with its mate. I do have slides to show that to prove that. And so, if you're talking about scary, I was more scared when I when I blundered and got too close to that owlet than I was when the when the um, when the two coyotes were walking with me. Wow, those are incredible stories. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you so lots much. Lots of things happen uh, when you're on the trail. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully you guys can also have some of those cool experiences while you are out on the trail as well. And don't forget that, again, we have a photo contest coming up. You can go to ninemilecreek.org 
to look at the official rules and the deadline and entry forms, um, but just try and get those in by the end of September and um, you can be entered into our photo contest. Again, just a reminder, this will be recorded and uh, I will send it out to the email that you registered with. And again, thank you so much, Dick Bergstrom, for sharing all of your advice with us. My, my pleasure, Gail. Thanks to all for tuning in. And just quickly, if if you um, um, want to ask some more questions, um, you can get in touch with me. Send them, send your questions into Gail and and she will forward them on to me. Thanks yes. to Million Campers. Enjoy. Get out. Focus on focus. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody.